Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mandy Binning. Dr. Binning received a medical degree from University of Colorado Medicine, completed neurosurgery residence at the University of Utah. Then she proceeded to complete fellowships in vascular and endovascular neurosurgery at the University of Buffalo and Capital Health. She is currently as an assistant professor of neurosurgery at Drexler University College of Medicine and serves as a chief of vascular neurosurgery at Global Neurosciences Institute. Dr. Binning established and directed many all-level stroke centers within the region, including leading the establishment of comprehensive stroke center within the Crozier system. Dr. Binning is uh, very widely published and known nationally and internationally. She also serves on the board of American Stroke Association. Today, Dr. Binning will be talking about the current treatment of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Dr. Binning. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction and I have a lot to cover. I'm talking about both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke and that really spans a wide range of uh, vascular pathologies. So, you know, we all know strokes, the number one disability leading cause of disability among adults and the fifth leading cause of death. Most stroke that we deal with is ischemic, about 88%, and about 12% is hemorrhagic. That means any cause of intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage, not from trauma. Really the mainstay of stroke treatment is to prevent a stroke in the first place. We can do that about 80% of the time if we manage those modifiable risk factors that you can see listed here. But despite our best efforts to prevent stroke, we still expect to see about a million strokes this year in the United States. And if you look at what we treat uh, as neurosurgeons or neurological emergencies, stroke is by far the most common condition that we treat if you look at it compared to traumatic brain injury, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, or AVM, or even tumor. So what I'm talking about today is what do we do in those cases when the stroke can't be prevented? What can we do for patients? So Dr. Glebus was discussing our comprehensive uh, status and what does that mean for us? Well, this designation was at, is relatively young. It was started in September of 2012. And I think at the time the thought was, let's have a, a center that can do everything, all components of stroke care, and that's still the case. But I think the paradigm has shifted a little bit in that, you know, it's not just all the spoke hospitals sending everything to the hub. We also want to provide our standard of stroke care throughout our network. And so the, our comprehensive team of experts is available to all of our network or hub hospitals where we can provide evidence-based protocols and algorithms and so our expertise gets handed down throughout our entire network. And by doing that, we can keep appropriate patients within their community hospitals, and then we transfer appropriate patients to the Comprehensive Stroke Center for Complex Stroke Care. And then when the acute phase is over, we wanna bring the patients back to their communities for rehab services and outpatient follow-up. And I think that if, you know, this is just a snapshot of the phone calls we got, I believe in a two month period, so, you know, this is that stroke hotline. You call, we say hello, and, you know, we're getting a call 80% of the time for acute ischemic stroke and the hemorrhagic stroke tumor seizure tends to be the other types of calls we get on that hotline. But 77% of the time, we're keeping the patients within their communities so that they can be close to family, close to their primary care physicians. And we're only transferring even, you know, 23% of patients who really need to be cared for at the Comprehensive Stroke Center. We all know time is brain, and whether the patient comes to our dedicated neurological emergency department, where all neurological emergencies are transferred to a dedicated portion of the emergency department, or if the patient presents to one of our network hospitals, we wanna make sure that we can rapidly triage and diagnose the patients and that really the same protocol and the standardization is seen the way the patient is triaged and handled uh, throughout all of our network. So how do we do that? We obtain the highest yield studies possible when the patient arrives. So we start with a plain non-contrast head CT. We wanna rule out a hemorrhage, tumor. We wanna see if the infarct is already completed. And that decides is the patient a candidate for alteplase or not? After we've decided that, we then go to more complex imaging, CT angiography, and CT perfusion. 
And this we want to know, does the patient have a large vessel occlusion? Because as I'll get into later, you know, that patient might be a candidate for thrombectomy. And some of our hot network hospitals have CT perfusion. Certainly we do at um, our comprehensive center at Crozier. CT perfusion tells us, is the territory salvageable or has the infarct gone on to be complete? So, you know, we have a lot of evidence-based protocols and research that we share with our entire network. So dye prep for those patients with dye allergies who need CTA, blood pressure management for acute ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, reversal of alteplase, treatment for angioedema, anaphylaxis, reversal for DOAX or anticoagulation or antiplatelets, management of ICH and acute ischemic stroke. And in the corner, you see Natalie Goffman, who's one of our brilliant neuropharmacists uh, who helps us develop these evidence-based protocols, which we share with our entire network. So as I alluded to earlier, class one evidence shows that um, if we have a patient with a large vessel occlusion, that, that, that it, removing the clot or thrombectomy plus giving alteplase, which is still the standard of care, is better than alteplase or TPA alone. So, you know, even if the patient presents to one of our other hospitals, we want to get the patient triaged and treated as quickly as possible. So we get the plain CAT scan, give the TPA, look for large vessel occlusion. And if there is a large vessel occlusion, transfer that patient to the comprehensive stroke center. We no longer wait to see, oh, is the TPA gonna work? Will it open up the vessel? because we already know that getting the vessel open mechanically is superior to waiting on the TPA. And so because of this, we have very extensive algorithms uh, for our CNI or cerebrovascular neurosurgical interventional suite, where we have a, one number where we activate transfer of the patient to us. It activates an entire team, including our neuroanesthesiologist, our neurointerventional team, the neurosurgeon uh, and uh, neurocritical care physician, which we're one and the same on call. And we're all there waiting for the patient. We have a dedicated neurocritical care and neurosurgical PAs. And so when that patient arrives to us, we're swarming the patient so that we can get the patient's uh, artery open and um, revascularize the brain or remove the clot as soon as possible. In addition, um, before the patient even arrives and as the patient's arriving, we're saying, is this patient a candidate for any of our new research protocols? You know, maybe injecting a neuroprotectant as soon as we get the vessel open or, um, you know, is the patient on Berlintiv? You know, we're one of only a few centers who can actually use a specific agent to reverse the Berlintiv. And then I looked everywhere for a picture of Suzanne Hefton, but I could not find one, but she's our dedicated stroke coordinator who is monitoring all of this in real time to make sure that our times are good, that you know, you know, we get the CAT scans done on time, our team is available, that you know, everything is done seamless, seamlessly. And then um, you know, just more of our research protocols and um, pilots and studies, all of these. Uh, we want to make sure that all of the appropriate patients who might be a uh, candidate for any of these are uh, evaluated immediately upon arrival. And so um, this, is, this is something that's all done in real time and is very well coordinated. This is actually the first patient who was ever uh, treated for thrombectomy in Delaware County. This is a 51-year-old female who presented to DCMH within one hour of onset of left-sided weakness. You see the arrow sign there. The patient has a hyperdense MCA sign and no intracranial hemorrhage. TPA was initiated at DCMH and then the patient was transferred emergently to Crozier Chester for CT angiography, CT perfusion. And you can see over here on the right, this area of uh, perfusion defect and CT angiography. Again, the arrow sign shows the occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. The patient was taken to our state-of-the-art CNI suite, which is a, a biplane hybrid uh, neuro operating room, and immediately taken for a procedure called stent retriever thrombectomy. This is just a cartoon showing how the um, catheter, we can start from the groin or from the wrist, get this catheter beyond the clot. 
you see that this uh, device, which is called a stent retriever, expands, it grabs the clot and at the same time restoring blood flow to the uh, ischemic hemisphere. And then it all comes out as one piece. And then once this is out, this is the time where now we can go up with the catheter, inject uh, a neuroprotective agent, which is one of our research protocols. And uh, this is just a study, or I'm sorry, this is just the angiogram that shows the stump prior to thrombectomy. This is that stent retriever in place on this specific patient, the clot that was removed. And now you have beautiful flow, what we call ticky three flow or revascularization to the affected hemisphere. So the patient was extubated, taken directly to the ICU, where she's awake alert. She's instantly moving her left side. She's evaluated by therapy and case management uh, immediately. And she's actually discharged to home neurologically intact. And you have a patient who originally came in completely paralyzed on the left side and the next day looks like this, is awake, talking, no facial droop. She's gonna lift her arms here in a second. You see no drift and she's walking around like nothing ever happened. And these are the outcomes that we see every single day. Um, now, when I showed you the slide earlier about the class one evidence for thrombectomy and TPA, those original trials were done usually within the six to eight hour window of symptom onset. But we knew anecdotally that we could treat patients several hours, sometimes even a couple of days after symptom onset. And if they had penumbra, we could get good outcomes. So uh, we were part of the DAWN study actually, and Diffuse 3 is a similar study that shows we can actually extend that window up to 24 hours. And I'll tell you just anecdotally, we can go beyond that as well. Um, so that the patients, if they have penumbra and a large vessel occlusion, we will do thrombectomy beyond that initial six to eight hours. And that's why our um, stroke alert protocols for all of our hospitals, we've extended that to 24 hours across the board. And this is important because of those million strokes we expect to see, at least a quarter of them are noticed upon awakening or um, in a very extended time window. So the Dawn trial enrolled 206 patients before it was stopped early because there was such an impact or um, significant increase in post-stroke disability with thrombectomy compared to medical management. And so, you know, look at this, a relative reduction of disability of 73% is astounding. And if you look at the number of patients needed to treat to have a positive impact in one patient, it's only 2.8. Uh, if you look at the number of patients needed to treat for um, Alteplase or TPA, for example, I believe that's, you know, I have to treat 10 or 11 patients to improve disability. So, you know, one in 2.8 is actually really astounding. So here's a patient who benefits from this. He's 43. He is in jujitsu class and he passes out after getting choked out. He comes to and he seems fine, goes to bed, but in the morning, his wife finds him with the right gaze preference and he's hemiplegic. He made it to the emergency department within 45 minutes, but he's not in the window for TPA. So he undergoes vascular imaging, CT angiography, CT perfusion. And you can see here, maybe there's a little bit of completed infarct in the basal ganglia on the right, but the entire hemisphere, as you can see in the dark blue, is at risk of brain, which means it has not infarcted yet. It will infarct if we don't do something to intervene. Now, as you can imagine, someone who's been choked out probably has a dissection of the carotid artery. And sure enough, you see a, di a dissection with a big thrombus sitting here on the dissection flap. And once we got the catheter past the, the big thrombus, we get into the, in the intracranial carotid and all of this should be blood flow. He should have some blood flow getting to his brain and there's nothing there, it's just a stump. So we use a different type of uh, thrombectomy here, which is um, just a large aspiration catheter and vacuum out the, the clot and get something like this out of the carotid artery. One, and this is important actually too, 
because um, this patient, even though we got the artery open, and I'm gonna go back to this slide, got the middle cerebral artery open, his carotid artery was still um, occluded down below from the dissection. Well, we don't have the luxury in these acute stroke patients to load them seven or five days prior with dual antiplatelet agents. And by the way, this is no way an advertisement, I have no disclosures, but we do have the um, capability and access to a really great um, IV medication, which if you wanna think about it as IV Plavix, that's essentially what it is, it's called Cangrelor. And we can give this medication IV rapid onset within two minutes, we have platelet inhibition. If we have to stop it for any reason, bleeding or the patient needs a procedure, we, it has offset within an hour. And you know, this is a medication that is not available uh, widely, but we use it uh, very uh, frequently as needed for these patients who need stents and are not already on dual antiplatelet agents. So this patient was immediately extubated, had improved gaze, was still a little weak, hemiparetic, but within 24 hours of this procedure, he could lift his left arm. And within 48 hours, he was discharged home. And when I saw him back in the clinic, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks later, he had already returned to work. I mean, he was just great. So this is a patient who had, was a wake up stroke, so to speak, but uh, we were able to intervene because our imaging told us his brain was salvageable. What about those patients who don't fit neatly into a randomized control trial? Uh, this, is a, this patient is such, she, she had 10 days of stuttering aphasia and right hemiparesis. And this is something, unfortunately, we've seen much too frequently the past year, is she was afraid to go to the ER because of COVID. You know, while the left hemisphere, if her brain is stroking out, she's afraid, of, she's afraid to come to the ER. So, you know, she has aphasia, she has right hemiparesis for on and off for 10 days. But um, she has, on this perfusion scan, what looks like penumbra or salvageable brain from a left NCA occlusion. And so you can see that on this video, there's a stump here at the uh, MCA bifurcation, one of the branches of her, uh, one of the divisions of her MCA is occluded. And there's a hole, a punched out hole where there should be blood flow to the left hemisphere. So, you know, even though she's not in, doesn't fit neatly into a, a randomized trial, we're gonna treat her because the imaging suggests that we might be able to help her. And we were able to get this open with a stent retriever. You now see she's got very good perfusion of her left hemisphere. And um, she's just got a couple of scattered infarcts in the left hemisphere, but you know, otherwise we were able to salvage that uh, vascular distribution. And I just saw her in the office this week. She's completely neurologically intact. She's an MRS of zero. She's still scared to death of COVID, but um, she, she ended up not getting COVID and uh, having her stroke treated. So that was great. Um, now, what about strokes in the posterior circulation? Uh, we don't have a randomized trial for this because you know, they're just not as common, but we can extrapolate what we know from the MCA, ICA occlusions to the basilar and vertebral artery occlusions. Uh, our group uh, collaborated with uh, several other centers to look at 100 patients with basilar artery occlusions. And what we found is if the patients presented to us within six hours of symptom onset, the rate of a good clinical outcome was twice as high than if they came in a delayed fashion. And so um, we are treating these uh, very frequently, but the truth is that even if the patients come beyond six hours, this is a fatal infarct uh, unless treated otherwise. So as long as the brain is salvageable, we're gonna treat these patients regardless. So this is a four, another young guy, 46 year old, presented with dysarthria and altered mental status. And his CTA at the outside hospital showed thrombus at the top of his basilar artery, and he was transferred for thrombectomy. Now, something we're doing routinely, whether it's for you know subarachnoid hemorrhage or stroke intervention, is radial access. And this was a perfect case for radial access for thrombectomy. And here's this fuzzy stuff in the PCAs and the superior cerebellar artery. That's thrombus. And just going through the wrists and uh, putting a stent retriever up there, we're able to get all of the clot out and uh, 
it, it was, you know, went very smoothly, just kind of one pass and everything came out luckily. And so his MRI, he does have a little bit of infarct in his cerebellum, uh, cerebellar hemispheres, but his brainstem was completely uh, preserved and he did, he did really well. He, um, he was actually discharged home on post-op day one on a DOAC because he was found to have new onset AFib and he's back to work and looks great. I, I like to present this case because this is someone I've been following for years. And when she came in, we, we were worried that it was too late. There was nothing we could do for her, but she's 26. She had headache and neck pain, vertigo, nausea, vomiting for two days after um, she had these little pygmy goats and the goat head butted her and kind of knocked her back on the ground and she didn't think anything of it. But two days later, uh, she, her husband found her hemiplegic and obtunded and she was intubated in the field. And she was found by CTA to have this, you know, the, most of her basilar arteries completely occluded. You can see the stump on angiography. And so again, with the stent retriever, we were able to get out this enormous clot from her basilar artery. And you can see on this image, everything intracranially is filling, which is exactly what we want. If you look on the image on the left, you see this rattiness of the vertebral artery and that the vertebral artery on the right is occluded. That's because she had bilateral vertebral artery dissections. And so the, the dominant vertebral artery was stented and um, she, she actually did very well. She was extubated the next day. Um, she was in our dedicated ICU, uh, was discharged to rehab. And now five years later, she's working, has two kids and you would never know anything ever happened to her. So, you know, everything I've showed you so far is for acute stroke intervention. So those patients who come in and we emergently have to get the vessel open, but not everything, uh, not every vascular abnormality and stroke is an emergent thrombectomy. There's a lot of other pathology that we see that uh, is a risk factor for stroke. So I'm gonna just go over this briefly because I know Dr. Hoffman is giving a very uh, comprehensive talk about carotid artery stenosis in a couple of weeks, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it in a stroke talk. So this is a 65 year old who passed out at a train station and part of the syncope workup is you know, vascular imaging, and he was found to have severe bilateral um, ICA stenosis. His MRI did reveal a left frontal CVA. I show this CT angio because um, what I like to show is this very thick concentric calcification, which we just know from experience, our balloons are not gonna crack that. So he's a great candidate for endarterectomy. On angiography, you see he just has a string sign on the symptomatic left side. And on the right side, it's almost just as severe as the stenosis is. So he went to the OR for endarterectomy. Here you see some intraoperative pictures. Uh, this is the common internal and external carotid artery before we open it. This is after we uh, do the arteriotomy and start removing the plaque. This is a big plaque that was removed. And then at the end, we close it all up and take off the clamps and he's good as new. In fact, he was so happy that with the left side, he came back in six weeks and had the right side done as well. And he's on a baby aspirin and has had no further stroke symptoms. We also do um, stenting for carotid artery stenosis, which we can do through the wrist or through the groin. And uh, more recently, we have the ability to do trans carotid artery revascularization, which is a direct carotid puncture uh, for stenting. And just a, a short video here, we just do a quick cut down on the neck, cannulate the vessel. And um, this is nice because as soon as the sheath is placed, what we can do is what we call flow reversal. So any plaque or anything is not going to the brain. It's gonna go through this sheath and then go through this filter before it's put back in the body through the femoral vein. And so, the, the benefit of this is while you're doing the angioplasty or the ballooning and the stenting, there's, nothing, there's no anti-grade flow to the brain. So you, there's not a risk of uh, embolizing to the brain. So you can see the stent being deployed here, all the while having retrograde flow of any debris that 
uh, would otherwise be going upward is now going downward, is being filtered out. And then at the end, we just close everything up. And so that's something that we have available to our patients as well. Uh, now I wanna talk a little bit about occlusive disease, so chronic occlusions of the carotid or MCA, and what fits neatly in there is Moya Moya disease as well. So it's not very common actually that patients, um, you know, if they have a chronic occlusion, it's not very common to need anything done because most patients have a complete circle of Willis, but every once in a while we need to intervene. So. This is a 45-year-old fireman who uh, presented with TIA. He was left-handed, and so his TIA was aphasia and left-sided numbness and tingling. And he was found by angiography to have this carotid occlusion. But at the time, he had very nice cross-filling through his anterior communicating artery, and we, we just treated him medically. His circle of Willis was doing the job. But he comes back a couple of weeks later and he presents again with stuttering aphasia. And the interesting thing was every time his uh, systolic blood or his mean arterial pressure would drop below 100, he would become aphasic. And um, he has this perfusion defect in the right hemisphere that he did not have before. And now he's no longer filling. We do the angiogram and you don't see any filling of the right middle cerebral artery distribution. So I, because it was a relatively fresh occlusion, just a couple of weeks old, I started endovascularly and tried to open the carotid up that way, but I just hit resistance and it was a rock and I could not, uh, I could not revascularize with catheters. And so in order to get him off pressors, get him out of the ICU and get him home, he underwent what, underwent what we call a direct bypass, which is um, using the superficial temporal artery of the scalp as a donor to the middle cerebral artery of the brain. And this is the early phase angiogram of that anastomosis. Here's an interoperative angiogram. This would be the superficial temporal artery anastomosed to the middle cerebral artery on the brain. And this gives immediate restoration of flow so that um, we can get patients off pressors and out of the hospital. And his three month follow-up, the bypass is open and you can see that his perfusion is symmetric and he, he was symptom free. So direct and indirect bypass are excellent treatment options for Moya Moya syndrome or disease as well. And um, we base the, whether we do indirect or direct really based on the, the acuity and the need for immediate blood flow or not. Indirect bypass, the other word for that is EDAS or encephalodural syn um, synangi arterial synangiosis. And what we do is use that same vessel, the superficial temporal artery, but we just place it on the brain. We can invert the dura, we can do burr holes. There's a lot of different um, techniques for doing this, but what it allows for is angiogenesis or the brain to parasitize uh, the vessels and the dura for its own blood flow. And it takes three to four months uh, for collaterals to form. So that's what I mean by whether you need immediate blood flow uh, restoration or not. Also recently, and this is really hot off the press, EDAS has been used for patients with intracranial atherosclerosis uh, to augment blood flow as well. And this actually was found to be uh, superior to maximal medical management, so aspirin, plavix, statin in certain patients. And that brings me to the intracranial atherosclerotic section, where this is a disease that is not... Um, uncommon, especially in patients with poorly controlled di uh, diabetes. We see it more commonly in pati patients of Asian descent, but um, we, we see it across the board and it is one of the more common causes of stroke. So this is a 69 year old male who presented in November with transient dizziness. You can see the diffusion uh, weighted image. You see strokes in the cerebellum. And then on the CT angiography where the arrow is there, you can see a very critical stenosis uh, of the vertebral artery. Now, this is someone who we, he was only on Plavix. So we gave them aspirin, statin, put them on maximal medical management. And um, this is really the standard of care after the SAMPRA study, which I'll get into on the next slide. And I'll get into why we don't just do the balloon angioplasty right up, up front. 
but he was started on maximal medical management and then came back in a couple months again with dizziness and a couple of new strokes. So now we intervene because he's had two strokes, radiographic strokes on medical management. And if you look at the FDA uh, restrictions for using a certain intracranial stent, that, is, that would be the on-label guidelines. So a patient actually has to fail medical management with two radiographic strokes before we can put a stent intracranially. And that had to do with the SAMPRIS trial that um, initially showed pretty dismal results with a 14.7% stroke rate with intracranial stenting. And the medical arm of that uh, study fared much better. Uh, however, more recently, we were involved in the WEAVE trial that showed if we selected patients more properly, if we we're a little smarter about patient selection and we treated patients on label, so the maximum medical management failed twice, uh, and if uh, experienced neurointerventionalists did the procedure, we actually had a much lower complication rate. In fact, the lowest reported complication rate for any prospective trial for intracranial stenting. So we, we stick to that unless the patient is acutely needing revascularization. And this patient did great. He, this was his initial, so the stenosis you can see on this lateral angiogram, this is after angioplasty and stenting. And I saw him back in the office and he, he is symptom free on dual antiplatelets. So I wanna get quickly now into hemorrhagic stroke and I really want to talk more about some of our newer treatments for this, but uh, you know, if you look at all causes of intracerebral hemorrhage, I'm talking about anything except for the first one. So any cause of intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage not caused by trauma. And so, um, you know, aneurysm, ABM, amyloid, all of those would fit into this category. This is a 42 year old woman who had a spontaneous headache. Now, um, if you see this CAT scan most of the time, as a neurosurgeon, I would, the first thing I would think of is trauma because she has a subdural uh, here in the right frontal region. But what was funny about it is she was adamant that she had no trauma at all. And then if you look at the Sylvian fissure, there's something funny here on the right side, something funny and round. And that kind of got my antenna up as well. And so she went for angiography and sure enough, she had a, a large dysplastic middle cerebral artery aneurysm sitting right there by that blood clot. So one of the benefits of our beautiful angiography suite is we can do an angiogram and then turn the bed 90 degrees and do a craniotomy. So because this was assumed to be ruptured, uh, she, uh, immediately uh, went for craniotomy right after the angiogram. We did not have to move her, didn't have to, you know, uh, switch rooms or drapes or anything like that. We just rotate the table, open the head, and find the aneurysm and clip it. This is just some interoperative uh, uh, photographs and different clip configurations that we can use. Or we can use a clip uh, that was developed by Dr. Vez that uh, is a GNI clip. And we have all of this at our uh, disposal at our stroke center. So the other nice thing about the hybrid uh, operating room or uh, CNI is that we can, after the aneurysm is clipped, before we close the craniotomy, before the skin is closed, we just rotate the table back shoot an intraoperative angiogram, make sure that the aneurysm is cured, and then we can close the head because we don't want to you know, do an angiogram after the fact and then have to bring the patient back to the OR. So the hybrid room has made this very simple. We also have a lot of devices to treat wider neck aneurysms that uh, have come to be really the mainstay of treatment for certain aneurysms. So flow diversion it does exactly what the name states. It diverts flow away from the aneurysm and into the normal vasculature of the brain. We currently are using several different types of flow diverters and we're using them for patients like this. This is a 27 year old who had a sudden headache and some blurry vision and was found to have this uh, large carotid artery aneurysm with a very wide neck 
And you can see here on the uh, 3D spin that this is wide necked aneurysm, dysplastic, and um, she's a perfect candidate for the less invasive treatment of a stent, or excuse me, of a flow diverting stent. And what this does is it does not immediately clot off the aneurysm such as uh, clips or coils would, but it diverts the flow away so that there's stasis in the aneurysm. And you can see that on the video that even after the uh, arteries in the brain are done filling, the aneurysm is still full of contrast. That's what we call contrast stasis. And that's really the precursor to the aneurysm clotting off. This is a nice um, treatment, especially for patients with any cranial nerve problems, because uh, the aneurysm as it th thromboses uh, will eventually shrink down and take any mass effect off of those cranial nerves. This is a 72 year old male with a subarachnoid hemorrhage who I just recently treated with Dr. Hakma, who had this large uh, basilar apex aneurysm. Now, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, even though we can do stent assisted coiling, especially with that uh, IV plavix, as I call it, uh, it's not ideal for patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage because they may need ventriculostomies or other invasive treatments. And we don't want to have to take the antiplatelet agents off and on. But we have a device now where it's all intrasacular or within the aneurysm sac. And it, there's no uh, nothing in the parent vessel itself. So that patient does not have to be on anticoagulation. This is something called a And you can see on this video how it expands, goes into the aneurysm and expands and stays wholly within the aneurysm. And this is the same patient. You can see stasis and the web device within the aneurysm itself, while all of the important arteries stay open. Here's a patient who presented with, he's a nine-year-old, and he presented with sudden speech arrest and syncope that resolved. And in a nine-year-old, uh, you know, any kind of intracranial hemorrhage, we're thinking AVM until proven otherwise. And sure enough, on his CT angio, He's got this insular AVM on the left, and sitting here is a bed of hematoma. So in AVMs, what we want to do in general is look for uh, if there's a dangerous component of that AVM, such as an aneurysm that may have caused the bleeding. So again, here's the hematoma on MRI and the AVM sitting on top of it. So this patient went for angiography. And you can see his angiogram uh, has this AVM it's exactly where we expected to see it. But the medial portion of the AVM, which is where the hematoma is, we thought we would be able to embolize that because, again, that's where we thought that the bleeding uh, arose. And so here you see a cast of our onyx, which is a type of um, embolic material that we used to glue off AVM pedicles. So in this patient, we are able to glue off the part of the AVM that we thought hemorrhage. And then what we want to do is bring them back after the, the brain edema is, has resolved and the hematoma has resolved and see what can we do for what's left of this AVM. So in some cases, we remove it surgically. And in some cases, we uh, can do radiation. But we have the ability, even in nine-year-olds, to do functional MRI. Functional MRI is asking the patient or the kid to do um, tasks. And specifically in this location, we are worried about speech. So the task that uh, was very important was word generation. So here you see bright spots on the functional MRI that seem to be sitting right next to the AVM and where we would have to operate to resect that AVM. So, you know, we were able to use this very important imaging to make the determination that we did not think surgical removal of the remaining AVM was the best option, but rather uh, what we call radio surgery. And radio surgery, the only downside is it takes two to three years to obliterate that remaining AVM. But you can see three years later, 
that the AVM has uh, completely disappeared. Well, what about somebody who um, we can remove the AVM? This is a, another young patient, 14 years old, uh, presents with collapse, needs an emergent ventriculostomy because of this blood in the fourth ventricle here and hydrocephalus that you can see. And she undergoes CT angiography, MRI shows a large AVM in the right cerebellum. And same thing, we're able to take her to the angiography suite and embolize the portion of the AVM that was closest to the hemorrhage, in this case, the fourth ventricle. So we're able to get rid of a lot of the deep portion of the AVM. And then after embolization, we're left with this so that we can take her to the operating room and you know we have special sheaths because she's prone. We can um, we, we place a sheath. We're able to do intraoperative angiography again so that we know the AVM is cured before we even have to close up. So that when we come out of the operating room, we can tell her parents she's cured. She's never going to bleed again. She's going to be fine. So uh, this is a 42, another cause of hemorrhagic stroke, uh, central venous sinus thrombosis, a 42-year-old female. She presents with right-sided weakness and then has a generalized seizure. Again, my antenna went up a little bit because I saw all of the edema around that hemorrhage. And when you see that on an acute bleed, you worry about a sinus thrombosis. And sure enough, you see a clot here in the superior sagittal sinus. And on the reconstructions, there is no superior sagittal sinus. It's completely occluded. So, you know, this is something that we manage routinely and are very comfortable managing at even our partner hospitals with systemic anticoagulation. But in certain cases, if the patient does not respond to that or if there's clot propagation or um, signs of elevated intracranial pressure, then in some cases we do have to intervene and do aspiration thrombectomy of the superior sagittal sinus. So we, we can use our ischemic stroke tools for this as well. And then finally, intracerebral hemorrhage clot evacuation. This 42-year-old hypertensive male presented with left hemiparesis and neglect. And this is a patient of Dr. Liebman's who um, underwent minimally invasive, minimally invasive endoscopic clot evacuation. This is all done through a burr hole. And I will just pref preface this with, you know, in the 90s, there were trials, stitch one, stitch two, that said, you know, it really doesn't help to evacuate these clots unless you're doing a life-saving surgery for a patient extremis, you should just leave them alone. But um, nowadays we have a lot better technology, minimally invasive technology, where we can do this through a burr hole with a wand that, uh, breaks up or morselizes the clot and then vacuums it out. So this is an endoscopic aspiration system. So we're looking at the clot the entire time through an endoscope. It's image guided. So we know exactly where to put the burr hole. You can see Dr. Liebman here. There's image guidance in the picture and he's looking at the endoscopic picture on a screen. So this is what he sees is a blood clot but at the end, he sees brain with an evacuated hematoma and hemostasis. What's important about this is the post-operative CAT scan shows beautiful clot evacuation. And I would say the verdict is still out a little bit whether, um, you know, long-term outcomes of this procedure, but I can tell you just more on short-term, the patients do better, have shorter hospital stays, fewer trachs and pegs, less cerebral edema, um, you know, less of the languishing in the hospital that we normally see when we just leave the clot alone. So um, long-term, we certainly know that it can, it's safe and we know that um, patients do well, but we're still waiting on sort of the, the long-term data to know, uh, you know, three, four, five years out, are the patients doing better? But I can say anecdotally, on the shorter term, we, we like what we're seeing. So um, finally, I just want to go back to that whole comprehensive stroke center concept and transitions of care. We have very close collaboration with social work and case management, uh, our rehab and therapy colleagues. Again, I showed you our advanced practitioner support, both inpatient and outpatient, as well as uh, we have multiple outpatient sites for pre and post-surgical care. So our goal is always to get our patients back to their communities, whether it's for rehab, uh, 
whether it's for um, outpatient care. So we have multiple sites where we go to the patients to see them post-stroke. Uh, if you look at our discharge disposition, most of our patients are going home. And the, and the second largest chunk of the pie is we get the patients to inpatient rehab. And again, we always wanna get them back to their communities for rehab. We have very extensive inpatient and outpatient neurology support so that um, our, it's always our group who's seeing the patient, whether it's in the hospital or outside of the hospital, as well as neuropsychology, which is something that most groups don't have a lot of access to. But for any of our patients with cognitive problems, we can uh, get them in very quickly and it, it's so nice. So in conclusion, we have quick and effective acute stroke care at any level, whether we're treating our patients at our primary or our comprehensive stroke centers, but we wanna improve timely diagnosis, speed up initiation of stroke treatment and improve patient outcomes. Comprehensive care for both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke requires a dedicated team of experts available 24 seven who have expertise in all the new technologies, but also the old ones as well because not everything's amenable to all the fancy stuff. And so we, um, we really wanna make sure that our system of care and infrastructure meets the patient's needs, uh, the needs for our partners, and that we can manage everything from admission to post-hospital care. Um, so thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bing, it was great talk and you know it, it seems like with a stroke you know there were some roadblocks because maybe poorly designed trials in the past or something but it seems like with us when it comes to stroke management it's really entering the golden age and uh, you know it, it's it, every time you hear you know a stroke talk it, it used to be you know it's just aspirin plavix aspirin plavix right now actually we you know there is something to show <laughs> about you know to, and something to discuss we do have several questions about uh, from stroke so um, i'm just going to go in the order i, I, I I just do want to say one thing to, to your point. What you said was, you know, I've been out of fellowship for 10 or 11 years now, but it's funny that I've already seen stroke care so rapidly evolving. Like, for example, intracranial atherosclerosis. I've already seen the pendulum swing from stenting everyone to stenting nobody to stenting some people again. And it's just very rapidly evolving. And you know, it is it is really good to hear that actually there is a movement towards that because those were the people, I mean, we see so many stroke patients like that and those are the people where it's like, well, I'm sorry, there is nothing else to do. And maybe yeah. there is something actually to do. Yeah. So the questions, um, does congenital basilar artery hypoplasia correlate with posterior fossa symptoms? If so, are there any potential endovascular interventions that could help? I'm sorry, did what hypoplasia? Uh, the congenital basilar artery hypoplasia. Oh, so no, uh, it, just in short. So when it's congenital, that usually means that there's a robust system, whether it's um, what we call fetal posterior communicating, or, excuse me, fetal posterior cerebral arteries, or sometimes you'll have a persistent trigeminal artery that, um, is providing really robust blood flow to the posterior circulation. Usually if it's congenital hypoplasia, it's hypoplastic for a reason. And it's because you have other fetal uh, circulations that are getting blood flow to that area. What is the role of intraarterial altoplasia in the acute ischemic stroke? You know, we use it very infrequently. I would say that um, Right now we're using it maybe for some very distal occlusions where uh, our devices, you know, our devices can go into second and third order branches, but maybe if you have a really distal clot that you don't want to put a device in because you're worried about tearing the vessel, we might use intraarterial alt place for that, but it's, it's pretty infrequent now. What are your thoughts about uh, assessing and screening for obstructive sleep apnea when it comes to a connection for stroke? You know, I think that there's so many risk factors for stroke that are wrapped into obstructive sleep apnea, whether you're talking about, um, you know, hypertension or uh, just, you know, poor oxygenation while you sleep. I, I think that it's good to screen as an outpatient for that. Um, you know, for a while, a lot of the stroke centers were going to inpatient screening, 
but then it was kind of like, well, well, what do we do with this information? Because they still had to usually see their primary care, someone to get all the equipment for home. So I think it's really appropriate to, to screen as an outpatient. Um, wasn't SDA MCA bypass stopped in the 80s because of the lack of efficacy? So the, the cost trial, COSS, actually showed really no benefit for certain patients with carotid occlusion. But um, there's always a group of patients that we need to have that um, procedure for. So I think one good thing about our program is that you know we have people who have the expertise to do that procedure, SCA, MCA bypass, for the patients who need it. So for Moya Moya, for example, it is still uh, the mainstay of treatment for a lot of Moya Moya patients. And then for this patient that I showed, um, there really was no other option. So in general, I agree for a chronic occlusion, bypass is not our go-to procedure, but every once in a while you get a patient that needs to have it and you have to have somebody who can do it, so. Sure, sure, sure. Now, about the efforts to extend TPA window, IV TPA window, anything's going on in that you know, direction? Yeah, so actually I, I glossed over that and I should have spent a little more time on it. Um, it was on my neuro, neurological emergency department slide. Um, so there are randomized trials that have extended the window for IV TPA to nine hours. And that's based on um, functional imaging, so CT perfusion, but also MRI. And the way that the window is extended is, you know, if a patient has a wake up stroke or symptoms, uh, up to nine hours, we get the imaging. And if basically the imaging has to be normal, there, there cannot be any sign of large stroke or perfusion, deep, uh, completed stroke on perfusion. And we will give it in our neurological ED up to nine hours. Now, when it's, you know, when it comes to stroke, one thing is opening up the vessel and bringing the blood flow back. And another thing, you know, what to do with the, these hibernating, you know, neurons or something like that. Um, is there any, you know, what, what is happening? It's like a two-step treatment. What is happening on that second front, you know, of the neuroprotection or, you know, or rabbit, you know, how to make those neurons fire up and reconnect again, so. Right, so. You know, we're looking at that, and that's uh, one of the um, trials that we're doing internally. Is I, I mentioned it a couple times. Is after we get the artery open, we're actually injecting intraarterially a medication which is known to have neuroprotective properties. You know, there are other trials where it's been given IV or systemically after thrombectomy, but we're like, well, why don't we just give it directly to the to the artery that's bathing those at-risk cells. And so, uh, so far we've enrolled about 20 patients and uh, we probably wanna enroll about another 20 or 30 uh, before we present our data, but um, it, it's looking promising. Acute stroke in pregnant women. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the complicated situation, how, do, how are these patients being uh, approached? just like a non-pregnant person. So, um, you know, whether it's hemorrhagic- That's good to know, actually. It's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. uh, so for a hemorrhagic stroke uh, in pregnant women, a lot of times we're worried about eclampsia or health syndrome. So um, for that, you know, a lot of times it's delivery of the baby to help, the, um, to help with the blood pressure issue or the health syndrome. But in someone who, uh, is not ready for delivery and is maybe having an acute ischemic stroke, that patient is going to be treated um, the same as someone who's not pregnant. We will offer TPA. Um, there are guidelines for giving uh, TPA in pregnancy. I would certainly offer a thrombectomy. Everything is risk versus benefit, but um, you know we can protect the baby with lead while we're doing a thrombectomy. That's no problem. So. An acute stroke in children. You know, yep. what, how, is, how is that being you know, approached? So uh, very similarly, we uh, have, there's a lot of uh, more retrospective, you know, there's not a randomized trial of doing thrombectomy or TPA in kids. There actually 
they tried to do a trial of TPA in kids years ago, and it just suffered from lack of enrollment, I think, because nobody wanted to take on the risk. But, uh, you know, some, we'll give TPA in kids as long as the, um, you know, parents understand the risks and benefits of it. It has been shown to be safe. Some centers will give it in kids above the age of 13. Someone, some centers will give it to younger than that. Um, there's really no known age cutoff. I'd say any age cutoff is totally arbitrary. And then in terms of thrombectomy, same thing. If, if there's viable brain, we'll offer thrombectomy. We have small enough devices we can do it in kids. I think that concludes all the questions. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm on my end, you probably, I'm not sure you probably you know, can't see that, but in the chat box, I'm getting a lot of thank you, which you know, people are asking to tell you for this great talk. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks again. I, I, I do believe that everybody who was on this, um, uh, who connected to these brand routes really learned uh, uh, many things where stroke is. And again, this is, seems like the beginning of a golden age. Thank you very much. Thank you.